Support for Docs Outside the Box comes from Set for Life Insurance. Set for Life means set for less. Their clients get access to the largest portfolio of discounts and unisex rates available nationwide. Check them out at setforlifeinsurance.com and tell them Dr. Darko sent you. Welcome to Docs Outside the Box podcast. This is your official show, looking inside the minds of cutting edge and innovative doctors. Think you'll find these stories in any medical textbook? Sorry, you're getting real life insight from men and women pushing the envelope beyond medicine. Ordinary doctors doing extraordinary things. Let's start now with your host, Dr. Nee Darko. What's good, everyone? This is Dr. Nee here. I'm actually recording this episode, or at least this intro, on a train. I'm taking an Amtrak train from Pennsylvania all the way back to Newark, New Jersey. And a lot of times I actually take the train as opposed to driving, mainly because I can get so much work done. I've got a lot of episodes that I got to roll through, and the four to five hour drive just really doesn't allow me to get anything done. So doing this train ride, I can become so much more efficient. So please just never mind the music or the noise in the background. Now, my next guest is known as the first doctor in the UK, the United Kingdom, to be blogging about money. Her name is Dr. Nikki Ramskill, and she is the force behind the blog called The Female Money Doctor. Now, her blog started about two years ago, and it has become quite popular in England, and it focuses on issues with debt, how to save money, as well as the steps that you all need to be taking on how to start investing. The difference, though, is unlike the majority of other physician bloggers here in the United States, her audience is actually her patients, not high net worth individuals like her colleagues. And she believes that in order for us all, in order for her patients to have true health, they really need to get the money stressors, the money nightmares out of their lives. So on this episode, you're going to learn about the woman behind this blog. You're going to hear about her personal approach to how she deals with money, specifically how she deals with debt, how she deals with savings, as well as investing. We're going to hear why her blog has become so popular. And something that's really interesting is she actually initially started off wanting to become an ob guy doc, and she actually was in that specialty. She changed directions. We're going to hear about her change trajectory, changing her specialty and becoming a general practitioner. And we're going to discuss all of those different things. Please make sure that you share this episode with others. Please be the cool guy and the cool girl and leave a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. It takes roughly about 45 seconds to a minute to leave this review. And without further ado, I present Dr. Nikki Ramskill. I got the female money doctor on the show, Dr. Nikki Ramskill. Welcome to Docs Outside the Box, coming all the way from the UK. What's good? Hi, thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited. Yes, yes. I'm real excited to have you. We met very briefly in Florida at FinCon. Yeah. I think yeah. over lunch. And since then, I quickly looked up your blog and read more about you. And I wanted to have you on the show. And now we're here. So yeah, really absolutely. excited, excited about what you've been doing over in the UK from a financial yeah. standpoint. And, you know, I'm just really excited just to have you on the show because I think we need more diverse voices on the topic of money. So that's why I'm really excited to have you on the show. Oh, thank you so much. Yeah, we did. It was, VinCon was so quick though, wasn't it? It literally felt like it was over in seconds, but it was an amazing experience. That was my first one, actually. I don't know if it was your first one as well. That was our first one. And we had just gotten back from our trip to Africa, to Ghana. We did some medical humanitarian work from there. I'm also from there also, so visiting family. So literally, we had gotten back from a three-week trip and then dropped our son off at his grandparents and then like the next day jumped on a plane. (laughs) (laughs) So we were a little bit jet lagged, but it was fun and it went fast. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I remember chatting to you both and I think what for me, I couldn't get over how busy your lives actually were. The things that you did and remember you telling me about your humanitarian work as well. I'm thinking, wow, these people <laughs> are doing some great work. So yeah, it was very inspirational to me. Well, we had to take your advice, you know, the stuff that you talk about with savings and all those different things <laughs> to kind of start doing that stuff. You know, so we're all interrelated in some form of fashion. And, you know, there was one point where we all sat at a table and had lunch we broke bread and had fun and were politic and so to speak. And, you know, just kind of felt like a cohesive group of doctors. So I just want to know, like in the UK, is there something similar where like the financial doctors come and talk or just in general, the doctors just hang out and communicate with each other like that? Oh, do you know what? So far, 
there are very, very few doctors actually writing about money. In fact, I think when I last looked at it, I was the first one that I have come across to be talking about money. And there are others, and I have, you know, vaguely seen what they've been doing. You know, if there's not that kind of same atmosphere, it's something very unique to FinCon, and I loved it. I love being part of that group, and it was brilliant. I mean, obviously, we do meet, we do have our connections, and we do go to our meetings and things like that. So we do go out for meals and things. But in terms of doctors talking about money, it just doesn't happen in the UK yet. I'm sure it will change, but at the moment, no. <laughs> <laughs> to the point where you even say the first ever yes. doctor in the yeah. UK to yeah. be blogging about money. So I guess you want to make sure that's emphasized. <laughs> yeah, well, I this is, it. you know, when you're the first at something, you kind of have to make a noise about it, don't that's you? Right. <laughs> that's right. That's right. I mean, nowadays, you know, you get a lot of credit for getting out there and being the first one to do things. And I think what's interesting about you, though, is you're the first ever, obviously, I got to underscore that doctor in the UK to be blogging about money. But I think unlike what's going on in the United States, most of the physician doctors in the United States who are blogging, podcasting, vlogging, so to speak, they're kind of talking to other doctors. Your audience is different, right? Can you tell us about that? Yeah. So I basically felt that I wanted to speak to people that were potentially my colleagues, my patients, because I could see that money affects absolutely everybody. And, you know, doctors especially, it does affect them as well. But I think we're sort of more shielded a little bit from struggling with money sometimes because we actually can bring in more money. We can fix problems much more easily than than others that don't bring in as much money. So it never really felt right to me to be talking to other doctors. And maybe that will change. But at the moment, I'm speaking to other women, some men, but mostly women of my generation, people that potentially could be my patients or my, you know, my nursing or midwifery colleagues or, you know, something on those lines. But there are doctors in my group as well. So it's not like I'm not talking to doctors, but it's not my main focus. No, I love it because at least for me, I always get concerned that, okay, people who don't make the same amount as me or people who are like my colleagues, like, will they be able to relate to me? But you haven't found that problem at all. So that's pretty cool, actually, I think. Yeah. I mean, it's, obviously there are limitations because I won't be able to help people that, you know, that need really specialist help. You know, obviously there are people out there that are lots of really bad debt. They can't afford to feed themselves, a family, that kind of thing. And that's out of my comfort zone. That's something that, you know, a really serious professional absolutely has to help with. But You know, for other people who can, you know, afford to save money every month, who can start investing, even if it's small amounts, who can do that, who have got that ability, they're the people that I want to talk to. So, Mm. Have you found that they have like the similar issues that we have here in the United States, kind of living outside the means, credit card debt, you know, buying cars that they shouldn't afford? Are those similar things that you see over in the UK also or? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, a lot of it is lifestyle. So I think lifestyle has become a lot more expensive, you know, in the US and in the UK as well. So it's a lot more difficult for people to kind of do and have the things that they wanted to do. But I also think there's a lot of kind of unconscious spending that goes on that kind of crosses both countries. So it's more about bringing consciousness back into spending. And, you know, myself included, I often have to come back to first you know, principles and actually look at it again and think, right, why am I buying this? What's going on? What are the emotions around it? So there's a lot of that going on as well. So definitely. Well, since you brought up yourself, let's talk more about you. Like, why did you decide to start your blog and when did it start? So I've been blogging now for just over a year. So I started it in July 2017. Yeah. So it will be coming up to 18 months. And it really came off the back of when I started to teach myself how to deal with my own money. I kind of read other people's blogs and listen to podcasts and yeah, went on courses, things like that to teach myself. And then the more I became aware, the more I became aware in other people's lives as well. So, you know, patients would come in and they'd say things like, oh, I can't afford to have time off work because I can't afford, you know, I haven't got the money to be able to get by for the next six weeks while I'm letting my legs heal and things like that. And you can see the panic on people's faces and you know, getting through to the other end of their working lives and realizing they haven't got enough to retire with because they now suddenly have to pay for you know, fees for a care home or, you know, something like that. And the government won't start helping you until you get to a, you know, really low level of net worth. So it's a very difficult situation that affects a lot of people, including my colleagues as well, people working extra shifts to try and make ends meet or, you know, midwives and nurses using food banks because they haven't budgeted through their maternity. Are you serious? Yeah, absolutely. Completely wow. serious. And when you see stuff like that, you think, wow, like I've learned some really cool stuff from other people. And 
I can't see anybody else doing that kind of stuff. So I felt like it was natural to start talking about it. I wanted to do a blog anyway, but I just didn't know what to write about. And then it kind of hit me that actually you have got a really great topic to talk about. So why not give it a go and see what happens? And the rest is history, I guess. I mean, absolutely. <laughs> so what are some of the tools, some of the tips that you're out there telling people to do to help them get to the point where, you know, they're not in the situations that you described? Is like budgeting part of it? Is it very similar to what we see in the US? Yes, absolutely. So it's definitely about conscious spending. Um, so budgeting really well, trying to budget for things that, you know, you wouldn't necessarily budget it before. So things like making sure that you've got enough money set aside in an emergency fund, for example. Loads of people don't have even £500 set aside for basic emergencies. Myself included, I, I'm definitely in that bracket. I'm not anymore, but I was when I first started. And you know, it's about budgeting. It's about putting aside some money, being okay with not spending every single penny in your account every single month and being okay to have that left behind. And then starting to invest. So you're not only dealing with your own finances for now, but you're also dealing with it for the future as well. So yeah, that's the kind of message I'm trying to get out there. Now, one thing that you mentioned, I want to go back to that. You mentioned that at one point you didn't have enough for yourself to save for a really adequate emergency fund. So I just quickly, while you were talking, you said about 500 pounds. So right now on this day, that equates to about $642 in United dollars. So, I mean, obviously there had to be some struggle on your end. Do you mind if we go into that and talk about that? that time. Like, so like, let's talk more about like money, your relationship with money, maybe even into childhood. Do you remember like, what was your earliest money memory? Wow. So I've been asked this question before and I really struggle to remember. I remember not really saving any money. I don't really remember sort of getting excited about saving money. I remember getting excited about spending it. So, you know, going out shopping with my friends, buying things I wanted, that was never a problem. <laughs> the saving, I don't really remember doing, to be honest. For me, my relationship with money has always been the spending side of it. The, you know, what can I get for the, this money, you know, and spend like every single penny of it. Was that something that was money ever talked about in the home or was it taboo mm-hmm. or anything like that? Little bit, little bits and pieces. I mean, my mom used to say things like, don't get yourself into debt, don't use a credit card. She'd sort of show me how she budgeted, but it never really worked for me. I never really got how she did it. And then when I went to medical school and started taking out loans to cover me through medical school, it kind of just... I met school in the United Kingdom and many countries there was a significant that was subsidized. You still had to take loans out. Yeah. I mean, when I was doing medicine, so let's, I qualified 10 years ago. So we're talking 15 years ago now, Mm -hmm. 16 years ago, something like that. Medical school fees were literally just over a thousand pounds a year. They were so, so cheap. It was ridiculous, but you'd still have to take a loan out for living and things like that. Because obviously medical school is intense. You work in you know, Monday to Friday. You don't really get a lot of time to work and support yourself. So you take a loan out to sort of the living expenses as well, if you like. So for me, debt was just a natural part of life. And I just kind of ignored what my mom said about not getting into debt. So <laughs> got into even more debt, you know. Right, right, right. right. <laughs> you know, that's a similar upbringing that I had in my household. It was save, 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 save don't get into debt. But in terms of like the specifics, use this checking account or you should invest at this age or you should put into this investment. Like that stuff never really got talked about at all. So it's really interesting. Very similar background. Yeah. And it's funny because my fiance, he comes from a household where his mum budgeted extremely well. You know, she had the kind of pot system. So she'd have different purses for different things. So if she was going to go out with friends, she'd have one set of money. If she was going to go out shopping, she'd have a different set of money. And he learned that from her. So when we met each other, he couldn't understand how I just didn't grasp the basics of budgeting. And I had to sort of have all these spreadsheets and things to sort of get me keep myself on track. So it's funny how different upbringings lead you to different points. So now what was there had to be a point where you had that like aha moment, that epiphany Mm -hmm. moment. You know, was it like getting your card rejected at some place or something like that? (laughs) (laughs) Tell us about um, that. It's going to sound really pretentious, actually. So I basically decided I didn't want to do OBS and Gynae again anymore. I've been doing it. Really? Yeah. So it got to, this is OBGYN for people that don't know how it is in England. But so obstetrics and gynecology was my specialty for four years. And I got to registrar level and I can never remember what you call that in America. Okay. So you finished medical school already and then you're doing some years afterwards now? Yeah. So this is now after medical school. I'd got to a stage where I just couldn't do it anymore. I couldn't stand the stress and the anxiety and I left. Really? Um, I took some time out at that point and went traveling for five months. 
Now, the problem with that is that I was in a lot of debt at the time. So I got myself into even more debt to go traveling. And it was while I was away that it kind of hit me how bad things were. And because I had time to sit down and work out my numbers. And it was like an epiphany moment where I just sat there and went, you've got to change. You have got to change. And I started reading finance books while I was away traveling. Again, I had time to do it. So that's what I started to do. And when I got back, I was like in the mode of, right, I'm going to save and change my life. It was literally that moment. So you already spent the money. You might as well tell us where you went to go travel. So (laughs) I've been wanting to travel since I was about 13 years old and I had it all planned out in my head already. So it was things like I wanted to start off in Australia. Okay. Then I went to New Zealand. I went to Fiji. It was amazing. And then after that, I went to Bali, met a friend, then went across to Singapore, then Japan, and then Southeast Asia and did like Thailand, Vietnam, you know, all around there, basically. And it was amazing. I absolutely loved it. And I don't regret a single moment. But now I'm making up for it by paying off everything that needs to be paid off. So, But it opened your eyes to things, though, you know. Yeah. And, you know, it's really funny how similar our backgrounds are. So you went on this trip and you kind of got an epiphany and you spent some time and you were able to figure out exactly how much debt you were in. Same thing happened with me and my wife. We were dating for an extended period of time. She did her residency in another part of the country. I did my residency somewhere else. So we had a really long... <laughs> dating time. And we finally decided, you know what, we're going to have a really nice honeymoon. And we actually did Australia, New Zealand, and we did Bali. And we did it in a month. And in that month, though, even though it was expensive, we were able to pay for it in cash, right? Wow. And with that, at that point, though, we weren't paying off our student loan debt. We were in forbearance. We were deferring everything. We were making all the mistakes that you could make. But it wasn't until we got on that trip that we realized that the only reason that we won't be able to make this trip again, maybe in five years or 10 years, is one, that we have so much student loan debt, two, that we're working. And then we started to click. It was like, wait, if we can pay for this trip, you know, up front without having to take up any debt, why can't we do that with, you know, other significant things in our lives? Like, why can't we just get a car used? Why can't we blah, blah, blah. And that started our epiphany also. So it's pretty similar things. Yeah, I think the problem with medicine is it doesn't give you a lot of time to breathe, let alone think about your life. And you you can get onto this conveyor belt and you end up just blinkered to what else is going on. Then when you come off that conveyor belt, you're like, oh, hang on, there's a life out here. There's things people do stuff outside of medicine. Like, wow, that's when you really start to notice it. So yeah, I think I agree with you on that one. So when you got back to the UK, what was some of the first things you did to kind of change your financial life around? Well, the first thing I did was set up a budget and it's still a work in progress. You know, I often tweak it. So every couple of months, I'll look at it again, make sure it's still reflective of how I spend my money and make sure I try and adapt it. Um, I tried to I set up the snowball method of paying off debt. So I started off on those lines. So, and from, the then, small, so from the smallest debt to the largest. That's it. Yeah. I just felt like it worked better for me than other methods that I'd seen. Like I've read about, I think it's the avalanche, isn't it? Where you start off with the biggest debt that's got the biggest interest rates that you're right. paying more of it. But I just couldn't face it. I needed those quick wins and those little small ones to be paid off first. So that just felt right to me. And then I learned how to invest. So I started putting very small amounts it's still very modest it's not massive by any stretch but it makes me motivated to pay my debts off quicker because I want to be putting that money into investing so it's just that motivational way of you know getting me through I guess and then once you started doing that obviously you started to see what was going on with your patients and so forth what was it like deciding okay I want to start this blog was there any you know any sense of imposter syndrome any sense of someone will find me out or who am I to make this talk to us about that yeah it was really weird because there's somebody that I admire who basically runs courses and blogs and things from South Africa Anne Wilson and she's absolutely amazing and I followed all of her work and when I started thinking about the idea of doing something similar I felt really who am I? It was like, look at this woman. She's amazing. She's a multimillionaire. You know, she does all this stuff. People find her work amazing. And then there's little old me thinking that I could do something similar for English people, for people that, you know, are struggling. So yeah, it took me a long time to kind of get over myself when I realized actually there is a big need for more people, more voices in different, you know, different walks of life, basically for the same purpose. So yeah, for a long time, I was guilty about it. I felt worried. I thought, oh my God, she's going to think that I'm trying to copy her or something. But she just said to me one day, I met her, I went to a conference of hers and she just looked at me and she said, you need to do this because I told her about my plans and there we went. I just thought, right, the guru has told me I need to get on with this now. And, and you haven't looked back that. since. 
yep, there we go. <laughs> Tell me, what's the biggest thing that you've learned about yourself through this process of, you know, writing for other people, helping other people, meeting, you know, going all over basically the world and meeting other people who, you know, struggle or write about personal finance? I think one of the things that really strikes me about other bloggers and podcasters and things is that they're all so incredibly friendly. There is not a shred of ego going on at all. Everyone's really happy to share things, help each other out, you know, celebrate each other's wins. It's not like medical school, which can feel a little bit competitive and cutthroat and you know, you want to do better than everyone else in the class because you want to, you know, it's just an ego thing. But that's what I love about this is I've really enjoyed working with other people and just learning a bit about myself, about how I can stick to a, you know, a regime. You know, I want to get a blog post out every week and I have managed to do that for, you know, nearly 18 months. So for me, it's wow. like, it's impressive. You know, I can do that, you know, it's while working and still while working. Yeah. So once I don't have to work quite so many hours because I can go, you know, part time or something then I can start focusing more on my blog and, and who knows what will happen then, you know? So what do your colleagues think about this? I mean, do they supportive? Are they, you know, do they say anything, you know, snide remarks or anything like that? What's been the lay of the land there? I mean, it took me a long time to tell anybody. Did it, you blog anonymously initially or? No, I blogged about, you know, from my name and everything, but I just didn't make it obvious. I didn't go out of my way to tell people about it. Certainly not on my Facebook page and things like that. Then eventually people started asking me about it. And they're like, oh yeah, we saw you the other day on this thing or whatever. And it kind of just thought, why are you worried? You know, people, <laughs> um, was, no one was telling me you're, what you're doing is ridiculous. Not a single person has done that. So I think it was just me being worried unnecessarily. So now few people know at work, um, you know, and they follow me or they've joined up with stuff and it's fine. You know, if they ask me questions, they ask me questions. But at the moment, you know, it's not been a problem. Do you ever get any of your colleagues saying, please teach me how you do this? <laughs> how can I help me to get my finances in order? You ever get that? So far, no, I haven't. I have anyone that actually wants me to pick apart their finances and go into them in a lot of detail. Because to be honest, there's a fine line between giving advice based on my own experiences and then giving financial advice, which is completely not right at all. So I kind of don't want to encourage it almost. It's, you know, so, you know, if that happens, it's fine. But I need to be honest with people and say, look, I'm not a financial advisor. So whatever I say, you have to take the pinch of salt and do your own research kind of thing. What now, have you been able to kind of develop like, I guess, like a financial mantra or like a financial motto or even a philosophy that you have of your finances? Do you have anything like that? I think for me, it's about making life easier for myself. So the more I pay off my debt, the more I save for emergencies and things like that. And, you know, just to have a pot of cash set aside for paying off my car insurance in one go or, you know, paying off my exams in one go and things like that. It just makes life so much easier. So I just want life to be simple. So that's the point I'm trying to drive home is I don't want money to be stressful. It shouldn't be stressful. This is how you make it unstressful. So I love it. I love it. Now, one thing I actually heard you on the Hippocratic Hustle talking with uh, Dr. Carey. Yeah. About, <laughs> yeah, that was an awesome interview about you know your basically your philosophy of paying off debt. Like you are down with taking like the long term approach of paying off your debt. Can you talk to us more about that? Like why you decide to do that? The rationale behind all of that? Yeah, I mean I've seen loads of people that have thrown everything they've got at paying off debt, and it's great. And I take my hat off to them, and I think you know what they're doing is amazing. But I like having some savings and I like having some investments on the side because I feel like when my debt is fully paid off, I can then just hit the ground running and I know what I'm doing with my investments and I can just start throwing loads more money into it. And it's just really motivational. And I haven't got that pressing urgency to pay off my student loan debt because I don't have as much as you guys do when you come out of your university training. So it's not that urgency there. And you know, I know it's going to get paid off. It's on, it's literally, I've got the last loan left now waiting to be paid off and it's just being paid off bit by bit steadily every single month and you know it's just a matter of when now rather than if which gives you that kind of sense of security so I don't mind putting money into savings and investments at the same time I love it I love it I love the mantra I love what you're doing from a financial standpoint now let's get into some juicy stuff I want to hear about this like about face that you made from obsgyne obstetrics into mm. a general practitioner. Tell us about that, what it was like. Mm. There's a lot of people right now listening, you know, are either doctors or medical students who are facing similar type of decisions and they yeah. may hear from you, like what made you decide to change? Yeah, I think there's a lot of stigma around people changing during their specialty years. And oh, yeah. 
It's basically there's no need for it because I mean I don't know what it's like in America to switch, but certainly in the UK, yes, it's not necessarily easy. You have to come out of training and then you have to start a new training thing and you go back to the beginning of your position again and work your way back up the ladder. So you do take a pay cut. I've taken, you know, at least a thousand pounds worth of pay cut every month and it's now getting better again, but it took a long time for that to sort of come back to the way it was. And initially there was some pushback from my colleagues from Obs and Gyne. A lot of the consultants thought I was wasting all of my skills. That's tough to hear from yeah, them. Just to hear them say, oh, you know, it's a waste. You know, why did you bother learning all of this if you're now going to go off and do become a GP? And certainly a lot of doctors in hospitals will still have that same, you've wasted your specialty choices and everything. So yes, there's a bit of that going on. But to be honest, I just come back with, well, I've got much more career flexibility now. I can still do obstetrics and gynecology alongside my general practice. You know, it makes it a lot easier for me to have those discussions with women about their obstetric problems, their gynecology problems. You know, I've got so much experience that it actually sets me up to be a much better general practitioner than it would have done if I'd just gone straight out of medical school at the age of 24. So, And you made the decision to go into obstetrics like at the age of 18. Right. Uh, well, I was about 21 when I decided I wanted to do obs and gurney. Fairly um, young, though. Yeah, I mean, still really, really young. I'm such a different person now than I was when I was 21. And I was doing obstetrics and gynecology for the wrong reasons. I'd chosen to do it because my home life was incredibly boring. I did nothing. I had no social life. I was in a relationship that was really manipulative. And my life was just boring. So obstetrics and gynecology was a way out. It was like a kind of, it was a bit of excitement. You know, it was hands-on. I got to deliver babies. You know, you got to be a surgeon, have a bit of respect. And it was great. But then when the reality hits of what actually that means, you've got a mum's life and a baby's life and all these horrible things can happen. Your seniors don't back you up properly. You know, it's just really stressful. So when my life completely changed outside of medicine and I met an amazing man and had, a, you know, my social life turned around, everything was much, much better. Suddenly the need for that excitement at work just disappears. So it was getting in the way of what I actually wanted to do, which was live my life in the way that I choose to. So yeah, that's when it all kind of clicked for me and I decided to leave. I got to give you props because that takes a lot of maturity to do that, right? To me, I sometimes think that a lot of the angst, a lot of, you know, the bad interpersonal relationships that you see between doctors, I think oftentimes it has to do with them being dissatisfied with their job. Yes. And for you to be able to recognize that at an early age, you know, still really early is really impressive. So kudos to you. Slow clap for you. I'm glad you're in a great relationship now also. (laughs) Yeah, no, it's completely different now. I'm with a guy who's got a completely different outlook on life and just Yeah, it just puts your life into perspective when you realize that and you think actually there's more to it than just medicine. So that's when you need to actually go out there and start looking at what you actually want to do. And I think what happens is medical students and really new doctors don't do that properly. They don't look at how they want their life to be. So when they get involved in a specialty that demands, you know, 100 hour working weeks and ridiculous things like that. And, you know, all these things you have to do outside of medicine to try and get yourself up through the ranks and become consultants. Do you really want that? You've got to decide. Mm -hmm. It's not for everybody. No, it's not for everybody. Very true. I appreciate you getting personal like that and sharing that. Well, I love it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Now, look, we're getting towards the end of this interview. I want to ask you some fast fire questions. I just asked you some questions. You just tell me what comes off the top of your head. Game? Okay. Mm-hmm. okay, look, if we could pare this interview down to one concept, one thing, what's the one thing you want people to learn from this podcast? That I think it's not a bad thing to be different or to change your mind. You can change your mind at any point. And even if you think, oh my God, why am I changing my mind now? I'm halfway through my training or I've become a consultant. It doesn't matter. You can step back and reevaluate your life and do something different. You can always pivot. So that's what I want people to know from this. Love it. <laughs> okay, so now this one is, this is specific. I learned this because I interviewed with Dr. Rupi Aljula. His episode came out a couple of weeks ago in the UK also. He deals with culinary medicine, but I asked him a question about what he would do if he was able to give himself some advice as a pre-med. Now, obviously, you know, the things are a little bit differently in terms of the category. So I guess a pre-med would be prior to you going to medical school. I guess you in university or help me out with that. But if you could go back and give yourself advice before you went into medical school, what kind of advice would you have given yourself? Oh, yeah. So basically, I suppose pre-med for us would be, it depends really. I mean, you could be 18. You could be just finishing college and go straight into medical school. You don't actually have to do any university degrees before going into medicine. So for me, I don't think I really knew what I wanted at the age of 18. I just 
knew that I enjoyed science and somebody said that you'd make a good doctor and you kind of just fall into it really I guess from that point of view but I don't think I'd do anything differently I think I'd still do what I'm doing except I think I'd want to tell myself to trust myself more trust the process it's going to get better things will change and it's you're all on the right path so I don't know what's going to happen to me in the next couple of years but I just know that I wouldn't change anything because it's made me who I am now so I'd carry on doing the same thing I like that. I like that. <laughs> What's the personal habit that you have right now that you're using that's helped you to become more successful? I think basically I'm a Taurian. So I'm a Taurus. I've born in April. I don't know if you know much about astrology, but people that are traditionally a Taurus are very stubborn by nature. So I've always been one of those people. And when I want to do something, I will do it. So, you know, be that exams or whatever, get into medical school, whatever it is. Now it's my blog and I just know I I've got a vision and I'm going to achieve it. So I think it's the tenacity and the stubbornness to get through and achieve what I want. So, Well, since you brought up that stubbornness and that, <laughs> what's the next step for the blog? Like, are we going to see like something else in a different format? Vlogging, maybe a podcast, mm-hmm. anything like that? What's next? At the moment, I think getting through my general practitioner's kind of education has to come first. So I've got another year left and then I'm done. But then in terms of the blog, I think I'd really love to get that, get it out there to a wider audience. So be that talking on stage or, you know, talking on other people's podcasts like I'm doing here, yeah. you know, those kinds of things. So that is just getting out there to a bigger audience and pushing outside my comfort zone. So that's what's going to happen next. I can't wait. So thanks. <laughs> now, if you had an opportunity to trade places with someone you admire, someone that, you know, you find really inspirational, who would that be? Yeah, it's difficult because a lot of the people that I admire are people I want to learn from. (laughs) So actually, I wouldn't want to trade places with them. I just want to be a fly on the wall and just watch what they do. But I suppose if it was anybody's life I'd want to change places with, I absolutely love Reese Witherspoon as a role model. I think she's awesome. I love her um, outlook on life. I love the way that she supports other women and just goes out there and makes change happen. So yeah, I think maybe that's a bit of a twee answer. I don't know. Hey, that's- we'll take it. Reese Witherspoon, <laughs> like it. movies are good also. We'll take it. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, what's one life hack or you know any form of technology that you're using right now that's making your life easier? Okay. So basically I use lots of different bank accounts. I don't know what you can do in America, but I can do different bank accounts. So I've got one bank account that I use for kind of gifting for people. I've got one that I use for paying off things like exams, education, books, that kind of thing. I've got another for kind of my general going out, eating, drinking, that kind of stuff. So rather than take all of those cards out, I've got one card and it basically encompasses all of them together. So all I have to do on my app on my phone is just switch between which card I want the money to come out of. Wait, are you serious? Yeah, yeah, just pay with one debit card. What app is this? It's called Curve. C-U-R-V-E. I hope it's available in the United States. I'm oh, looking I don't know. I don't know if it is or not, but it's brilliant. So basically, if I've got my business expenses, I just switch on my app and just flick between the different cards. And if I'm buying something with the Curve card itself, which is a separate debit card, I can I then found it. just pay for it using that. They're also trialing using American Express. So a lot of shops in the UK don't take American Express, but they do take the Curve card. So I can pay using my American Express, but with the debit card as the frontage for that. So that's what I'm using at the moment. It's awesome. I love it. <laughs> you, know, you just straight up just blew my mind with this. I love it. I love it. Audience, we're going to put this in the show notes. This is awesome. Maybe I have to have you come on and do like a little review on this. Yeah, sure. I mean, I obviously make sure it's in America first before I want to tell people this. <laughs> yeah, let me make sure I can download it first. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I use YNAB as well. I don't know if you've ever spoken about YNAB to your audience. But no, what's that? Tell us about that. So YNAB is an app called You Need a Budget and it's... American. Oh, YNAB, YNAB. Yes, I'm yeah, sorry. YNAB. Yep. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Um, I really love it, but I can't use it on my English accounts because it won't connect with them which is really frustrating. So I don't get as much use out of it as perhaps people in America would. But yeah, it probably would be the same with the Curve card. I just hope you can use it. Awesome, awesome. So that's my homework. Once we get off of this, I am going to check out the Curve app. And then obviously you need a budget app that's very popular here in the United States. Okay, I love it. I love it. (laughs) I I want you to answer this or complete this sentence. It's, I'm not just a doc, I'm a... Okay, I'm not just a doc. I'm the female money doctor on a mission to end stress caused by money. Boom, mic drop. 
<laughs> I love it. I love it. This is great. Dr. Nikki Ramscale, thank you so much for coming on Docs Outside the Box. Thanks for inviting me. Really, no, I, really, I really like what you're doing. I appreciate what you're doing, helping other people with their finances. But also at the same time, I really appreciate that you're sharing a little bit about your life. You know, we can oftentimes learn a lot from our mistakes mm-hmm. and the ability to kind of be open about that and share that with other people so other people don't make those mistakes. I think it's just as important also. So I just want to give you kudos for that and just acknowledge you for what you're doing. Thank you very much.